You could introduce yourself, please. Uh, my name is Wayne Kirvin. I am 66. And I'm forever being asked about a time in my life that I've tried to forget, but I always remember. Um, <laughs> I had a cousin who lived in Hackney. And um, I lived on the fringes in Bethnal Green at that time. And she said, Oh, you look good enough to go to where I go, which is a place called Barris in Mare Street. It's Bob Burton's. And um, they're all very kind of well dressed down there. And uh, they arrive in scooters, not all of them, bubble cars. And they're very kind of fashion orientated. And they wear bum freezer jackets and long pointy collars and uh, think good fellas. And you'll think of that period. This is late 59. Girls had bouffants. The, uh, the guys had college boy haircuts. They used to have their shoes made at stands in Homerton High Street. Wrinkle pickers with side buttons and everything. And uh, I met a guy who was a friend of my uh, cousins with others called Peter Sugar. It was a great dancer and it was the thing to do because it was a, originally a dance studio. The guy that owned it also let it out to make ends meet as a club. So everybody dressed up, the girls and everything. And the girls couldn't buy what they wore, so they used to go down to Petticoat Lane and buy fabric and you know a little lady around the corner who would make their clothes for them. And the guys would <coughs> have their suits made as well. And uh, I guess this went on until the middle of the summer of 60 then we started going elsewhere to the downbeat club which was above a pub or in a pub between uh, Stamford Hill and Tottenham and then we started to go to the Royal Tottenham they started a music night Mondays and Thursdays two bob to get in and everyone dressed up at the time there was town magazine but it was really I think it's overemphasized on what it was it was basically a very kind of upper middle class, lower upper class uh, gossip magazine, an article magazine. Every year they used to say, what would you do with a million quid? Guys from Hackney could only dream of what a million quid would look like. Then, I think the most important time was uh, the magazine came out. Um, the guy that was doing the magazine saw us outside the scene club which was more West London club. Hardly any East End boys used to go to there. They would go into the discotheque, which was before uh, the scene. So we didn't want to go in there because it was a bit, in today's language, uncool to go in there because it was West London, you know, that kind of thing. And it was live music as well. And, uh, but these guys came up to us and said, oh, you look different. Can we take some pictures, we would like to do an article. We've been following you around. You go to the discotheque and seeing them, and you go to the Royal Tottenham. And uh, Mark, who happened to be there, said, yeah, you know, and he was still at school, I think. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I was on the first shoot, and then the other guys did the other shoot. That magazine led to people outside of the area. So I say Hackney was the hub of everything the modernist, the word modernist. And people from the outside had read the magazine, which I was surprised because the magazine wasn't available everywhere. I, used to go, I was working in Fleet Street for a tailor and I used to go down to this magazine. It only had three. So how other people get to know, I don't know, but it, it started a movement. And I think the younger uh, the two year younger people from outside of the area, particularly West London and particularly the, the east end of south of Commercial Road, who always followed the Hackney people, whatever they did, they used to follow them. They used to go to the Royal or used to go to the Lyceum. Um, and they gave us a term called faces, uh, which is a, an old east end expression for being known. Uh, it was used before that. And I think Mark, in a kind of bit of wisdom, said, yeah, we're faces. I don't think the word mod is ever mentioned in that article. 
um, mod, the word mod, I think, just like fab and gear, was okay. like uh, the Daily Mail or the Sun or something like that. Mark could, Mark was the sort of guy that, when I was at school with Mark, he could wear, he could be casual but look the part. He, he had the looks, you know, if, if you say a 60 look, Mark probably epitomises that. He was, I don't know, he just looked good, you know, he just he looked kind of, he was like someone you wanted to be with. And he wasn't even famous then days, he was just like somebody that, I think there was other guys at school, that, and there was like four or five of us. But Mark was kind of the visionary, if you like. He, you know, he could put a shirt on an ordinary pair of slacks. He looked great. He was just smartness. I don't know so much because I, I, I can't physically remember seeing Mark in a suit or anything like that. But I can remember the shirts he used to wear. He'd have collars and stuff like that. And the t-shirt. I think his name was Mr. Pearson. He came up to Mark one day and told him to take the pin out. You know, silly things like that, but he, he was the only guy in the school that wore that. Um, Mark was absolutely immaculate. Mark trendy. always was like the Beau Brummel. Oh, right, yeah, absolutely. He was the Beau Brummel. Um, he was a little bit sort of way out compared to everyone else on Stanford. If you had a, a scarf, his would be a painfully scarf. The old fashioned Eccentric painful. little yeah. boy. Yeah. He was wonderful. But he, he dressed great before the mod thing. When I met Mark when I was nine and he was eight and we were, we were, we were that was before the mod thing so we were basically telly boys because we both love rock and roll and we just wore what elvis tried to wear what elvis wore gene vincent eddie cochran and he was great he, he looked great then first recollection of meeting mark bolan i think that's where we're going yeah. um when i was at school my first out of school i got beaten up and someone put their arm around me and said to me, you're not alone. And I realised that what Mark was saying is because you're, only, you're not the only Jew in the school. There's two of us. And my school life with Mark was, we were great friends. Um, but most of it was protecting each other. It's, we protected me more than I protected him because he was a bit older than me. But, um, yeah, it was an interesting, an interesting meeting. And uh, what he turned out to be was phenomenal. It was unbelievable. But school days with Mark was, wow. Um, he came from a more affluent family than, than I did. So I got hand-me-downs from Mark. He used to give me his jackets, his shirts. Um, and I was proud to have him. It wasn't because he was Mark Boland, the star. He was Mark Feld. He was my friend, you know. And, um, when he left school, I was pretty... You know, where's all my new clothes going to come from? <laughs> it's quite weird, really, you know. I remember going with Mark Fell, Mark, Mark Bowman, um, to Burton's Tailoring on the corner of... Mm -hmm. uh, oh, no, no, next door to Dominion Cinema. I know. Top, 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 top road. Road. And my dad came with, and we both had three-piece suits made in there with three fittings. It was, yeah. only, it was only for well, actually a lot of money. It was ten pounds. Yeah. Mark was ten pounds. Yeah. Yeah. With yeah. three fittings. Yeah. 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 Mark had a vest. But you've got to remember the average weight was only four pounds, five pounds. So yeah. that suit so that for ten pounds. Like three yeah. weeks wages. Yeah, two, three weeks wages. Um, yeah. If you could afford a suit, there was a place in. I'm going to dig into my memory now. Um, in Upper Street at the Angel called Maxi Seagull, I think it was called, and he used to make mohair suits. And they were, and the first fitting you went to was like, I've arrived. And you used to get all the rolls of cloths out and throw it everywhere. You know, you looked in, you pick one you like. And someone would say, I've got that, I don't want that, don't look like him. Yeah, there was a lot of individuality. Although there was a kind of block way of dressing, there was individuality when it came to suits. Kind of used for editorial was a shop called John Michael. Anyway, uh, John Michael was very expensive but we liked the clothes and it was very dressy, suits, shirts and ties and what have you, and gingham shirts, all the shirts were four guineas and all the suits were kind of very classic. Uh, as most of the tailors in the East End and Hackney were making of a spiv type suit and it was very hard because they must have bought canvases before the war and still had them. So it was a much more spivvy looking suit, wide shoulders and narrow. Uh, 
and um, John Michaels was a shop which uh, we would love to go to, but we couldn't afford it. So we used to cut out the editorial and take it along to various places, but they couldn't do it. Anyway, there was a shop in, uh, in Bishopsgate, which was a bit out of our territory, really. You know, Bishopsgate, we, did, we, we didn't really go to, and it was the other end of Bishopsgate as well, so it was going towards the city. Um, and uh, we, would, we thought this guy could do things. So we went along. And uh, he made a couple of jackets based on the John Michael Cardan look. And uh, most tailors had serges and hop sacks and traditional fabrics. This wasn't the West End, you know, and there was a big difference. There was a very big class division between the East End and the West End. The West End was much more luxury, guards like kind of people that were professionals and very stodgy. The East End was up the game for anything, but because everybody had been left over from the Teddy Boy era, they wouldn't leave well alone. You know, they would add too much to it. So we wanted to do a Cardan look. We had round collar jackets that Cardan brought out in 1959, 1960. And we also had uh, kind of very formal. Yeah. The Stanley thing was based on kind of French, Italian. Yeah. Free buttons, yeah. Free uh, buttons to the actual uh, And then there was, there was a guy. Local tenants. They were made by Burton's. Burton's, or, yeah. Burton's Bill made by Burton's. Oh, yeah, but there was Edinburgh. But then we went. Islington, yeah. Then we started going to all the local tenants. What was the one yeah. in Bethany Green Road called? That was called Harry Mars. Harry Mars, yeah. Harry Mars used to make a pair of trousers Trout, yes. with raised seams, little vents at the side, and those days they were beautiful. We used to use Harris yeah. Tweed. They were yeah. a bit rough around the goonies, yeah. but they were great yeah. trousers. Yeah. They would be, I think we used to pay like five quid for four, five quid. Four, five. Yeah. The style of the clothing then was, um, what was developed from Stanford Hill was a jacket which had no shoulder pads. Mm. It was called a drop shoulder a jacket, uh, a rattan sleeve, no shoulder pad, and it was a cut short away jacket front. with a cutaway front, which I could sketch for you if you want to. I've got one here. Have you really? No. But it's not from, it. it's from the States. Oh, it's right. the same style jacket from the States. Yes. Yeah. Um, that, that would be yeah, possibly a high two button or something like yeah. that. And then there was a man, uh, his name was Flash, his nickname. Flash had a stall in the West Kings Road. Yeah. Kings Road. Kings Road. And he would sell shirts with long pointed yeah, clothes. Yeah. In fact, they were so long you could tuck them into your socks. Yeah. They were really long points. They're coming down to your breast. Really yeah. roll yeah. long pointed yeah. collars. <laughs> And in beautiful fabrics, um, yeah, and that would be more and more of a casual yeah. thing. Yeah. You wouldn't wear that with a suit. Yeah. But we were like, Mark was absolutely immaculate. Mark Trendy. always was like the Beau Brummel. Oh, yeah. I must tell you how the scooters came about is that we used to go to Clerkenwell. And Clerkenwell was like Little Italy in those days. And the guys that lived in Clerkenwell worked in Soho. They worked as waiters, they worked in the restaurant business, and how did they get to work? On a scooter. And that influenced the scooters. And there was a <coughs> famous scooter shop in Essex Road, which most of the Jewish guys used to go to, uh, to get their scooters. Um, funny enough, although the Vespa is kind of, has an image, uh, it wasn't particularly powerful, both the uh, Sportic and the GS wasn't powerful. The most powerful was the Lambretta. 175 TVR, but it, did, it, it didn't have the kind of funky look about it. Funky, that came later, didn't it? Which, which I won off a song called Colin Ashton. I used to invite him up to my house with a friend of mine to play cards. He won it. Him on <laughs> he lost three weeks' wages, which may be 12 quid at the time, and then he wanted to put his scooter out for sale. So we cheated him out of his scooter as well. Uh, and when my parents come back, off, when they come back off their holiday, they wonder what I had a scooter from. I said, I won it. Who did you win it off of? So and so. Give it to him back. I went, no. Give it to him back. And I did. <laughs> and then there was the famous record shop. I think I told you. The R&B. The R&B. The reason why it's called R&B, and everyone on Stanfield took it as rhythm and blues. Yeah. So they sold records from all over. They would import records from the States. They become famous on Stanford, the R.
for reach a piece of penny. But a lot of people usually say it's R&B, R&B like in rhythm and blues. And that, I think, was one of the key things that people probably started checking and thinking that it was the old American rhythm and blues music. But then when people come in and ask, our customers come in and ask for particular records from the R&B side of things, she would try and get it. But that time, uh, where the shop ended up, it's not where it was. It was about 10 sh shops down or further down the road. Two, two six oh, I think it was. And then we moved to 280. Uh, but uh, when I joined them, it was at the smaller shop down the bottom. And that was like pack on weekends. So that's where I came in and with the music to you and whatever. I had an understanding of music because as a kid, I, when I came to England, I brought up a couple of records and it was like a gold mine <laughs> because we were, at the time, she was the only person who was um, importing records from the Caribbean or from Jamaica. So it was like, I thought I had, we just fitted in and everything worked out all right. Her personal choice, I think, would be jazz, all right, but she was business-like. She got on with most of her customers. I might not want to say this, but unlike her husband Benny, <laughs> he didn't get on with the customer, or the customer didn't get on with him. <laughs> but she was 100% business, and sure, because she was kind of easy going to a certain extent. She she had a good rapport with. But we all say all of the customers really, male, female, kids, black, white, everybody. She was all right. And the only problem we had there is sometimes Benny and the customers just didn't get on, and <laughs> yeah, friction mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. But she herself, she was all right. Most people, would, I think, most of the people who knew her wouldn't have much. Nothing bad to say about her when it comes to music. Yeah, I think. Well, right. how can I put it? She was she was the boss, and she had him like that. And if I go in there, I mean, I can remember the first record I bought in there. My God, bloody hell! Um, I think it was Mum's birthday, and I'd been everywhere. My mum liked Matt Monroe, and I'd been everywhere trying to buy. The, I think it was from Russia We Love theme, but it had to be in the EP. You had to get the EP to Ford Tracker, and nobody had it. So I went there. Somebody said, Oh, you've got to go there. And I looked in there, but never actually bought anything. So I went in and bought it. And he, she said to him, It's upstairs. And this ladder came down, and he climbed up the ladder, and he got this to come down and sold it to me. Like that. Benny was more the floor walker. In shop detective or whatever, <laughs> but we didn't have nothing out there to steal because it was only record sleeves, there was no records in it, <laughs> and even the cassettes there was just a sleeve and it was blank. I mean, sometimes people still walk off with a sleeve and things like that, but that was minor. <laughs> and when it went, it was, it was like you know, a bit of you was gone, it was really weird. But there's never been a shop like that, never ever. Um, I just always said when she, when she popped her clogs, I wouldn't mind having the key to the upstairs so I would look what was in there. <laughs> but it never came to pass. <laughs> Anybody who's been in Stanford up to say eighty, yeah. from eighty backwards, yeah. they would have known about the recognition. Yeah. That is a guarantee. Yeah. <laughs>